So when I was born in 1981, the internet did not exist at all. That was only 33 years ago, almost 34. No internet whatsoever. And now, today, the internet controls almost every single thing that we do in our day-to-day -day lives. If I could teleport back in time with this cell phone and all of its amazing capabilities, and I took it to myself in the 1980s as a child, and I showed it to myself, I don't think I would have the understanding of what was going on in this thing. It would seem sort of like a futuristic idea, something I would have found maybe in Star Trek, right? This is totally from Star Trek. It's a tricorder. You can go around, you can measure things, you can take environmental data. It's even better than a tricorder because you can take selfies with it, right? <laughs> you never saw Jory LaForge taking a selfie. So technology is growing at an exponential rate to the point where I think we can comfortably sit around and ask a very important question, and that is, is the internet becoming a living creature, okay? And as a biology professor, I really feel like I have it in my power to ask this, this particular question. So this is fairly simple. All we have to do is come up with a definition for the internet, and then we apply our definition of life to the internet, right? And then we kind of evaluate it to see if the internet is actually alive. So first, we need a definition of the internet. Okay, it lives in there. It's a terrible definition. And, and really, I don't think I'm qualified to give this definition, so I did what I always do in these situations. I asked the internet, <laughs> and, and, and the internet gave me a definition for the internet. So the internet is a global system of interconnected computer networks that uses the standard internet protocol suite to leak several billion devices worldwide. So basically, the internet is all of the amazing gadgets, the, the laptops, the cell phones, the random stations, the servers, that all talk to each other, and we're a part of it too, right? We use the internet extensively. Okay, got a definition for the internet. Now we need a definition for life. It gets really hard here. So biologists argue all the time about things that are living and not living. I'll give you a really great example, viruses. There are, many, there are many biologists that don't think viruses are living at all. And there's people like me that get angry at those people. And they demand that viruses are living creatures. And it's really complicated because the definition of life is hard to do. And so instead of stalling out here at the very beginning of this talk, I'll do what every American does when they're beginning to hit an impasse, and I'll ask the internet again, right? So I asked the internet for a definition of life and it came up with seven characteristics of living organisms. And I can tell you that I vetted these. I teach introductory biology. This is found in almost all introductory biology textbooks. The seven characteristics are usually universal. And so we can go through one by one of these characteristics, and we can evaluate if the internet is a living creature. So all living organisms have some sort of organization. And what we mean by this is if you take, say, a plant, a fairly large plant, and you, you look at it, you will find that the plant is actually composed of millions, billions of tiny little cells. And these cells make up different tissues, and these tissues make up the plant system, which makes up the plant in general. So life is organized from small things to larger things. And this really happens with the internet as well. The internet is composed of many, many small devices, like a cell phone or a computer, and they're all linked together. And each one of those devices is an individual cell that is part of this larger system, which is the internet. So the internet is organized very similar to the way that living systems are organized, in smaller cells. Living systems also grow over time. We see that single-celled organisms will grow over time before they divide into two. And even more complex systems will really go <laughs> through many different life stages. Some of them horribly awkward life stages. <laughs> but we continue to grow, and we continue to move through time and grow and change. OK? And the internet, I was so adorable back then. <laughs> the, the internet really grows as well. If we add a new computer, or we add a new cell phone, we grow the internet. But even more, even more than that, we add new ideas. When we add new fields, it grows the internet. It grows complicated ways. It grows in ways that we can't even imagine. Think about the predictive power 
that the internet has now. You start a Google search and it finishes it for you. It knows what you're going to do. It is growing in dimensions that we don't even understand. All living systems undergo something fancy that's called homeostasis. This is a, this is a fairly uh, typical over-the-top biology word. What does homeostasis mean? Basically, it maintains an internal balance. A living system maintains an internal balance. So a really good example of this is if you took a very tiny dog on a very long walk and his very short legs, he's going to get very hot, right? His internal system is going to get hot. It's going to be too hot. So he's going to give off that heat by panting. And that panting reduces the overall heat inside. It's like a feedback mechanism. We do something very similar. We sweat, right? So when we sweat, <laughs> when we sweat, we are cooling ourselves down. We are undergoing homeostasis. Stay with me here. Does, does the internet have homeostasis. Well, if you've ever stayed up late watching far too many YouTube videos on your laptop, you'll know that your computer will get very, very, very warm. And how does your computer respond? It kicks on a little tiny fan, and it cools the system off. That's homeostasis. That's just one computer. But what about the internet in general? The internet can do that, because think about the contents on the internet. Not everybody has the access, same access, the same content. It's regulating itself on the inside. It's maintaining an internal balance. That is definitely homeostasis. The internet is a really fascinating creature. And this next one will put it to the test. Response to stimuli. So when an organism responds to stimuli, we mean it responds in some non-easy-to-predict way using physics, right? So if I had a ball on the top of a hill, and I pushed the ball and it rolled down the hill, that's not really a response to stimuli, because I could easily predict that using physics. What I mean is something more complicated. So if like, I pushed the ball and it like, bit back at me or something, right? That's a more um, less uh, easy-to-predict mannerism, right? So all living systems, no matter how you stimulate them, you should get some sort of response to the system. <laughs> and the internet, in a very creative way, does the same thing. So picture a weather station that is connected to the internet, and it begins to rain on the weather station. That's a stimuli. And the weather station will note that it is raining, and it'll send that signal to a server, and that server will bounce around a bunch of things, and it'll end up on that cell phone. And then it will tell me that it's raining. But that's not that interesting as a response to stimuli. The interesting part is, it'll tell me that my drive is going to take 15 minutes longer because it's raining. Now that is not easy to predict. That is a response to stimuli. Living systems all undergo something called metabolism. Metabolism is essentially taking some sort of energy source, whether it be the sun or whether it be some sort of organic molecules that we can use to ingest, Right? And it, and it performs chemical reactions that allows us to grow, and it allows us to organize ourselves and homeostasis and all of that. That energy is necessary. This is very difficult for the internet because the internet does not have metabolism. So do we lose here? I don't think so. So I'm going to bring back my friend the virus. This is one of the reasons that people say viruses are not alive. Because viruses do not perform their own metabolism. They steal it. They steal the energy from a host. And so anybody that tells me a virus is not alive, that's preposterous. It has the power to steal, <laughs> right? That is so living. The internet doesn't even steal the power from us. We give it freely in exchange for the internet, <laughs> which is awesome, right? So a virus is a parasite, a living parasite in my mind. The internet is not a parasite because we exchange. We call that a mutualist, right? The internet, as an organism, has us as a mutualistic host. And we are providing the metabolism in exchange for something that we can use to grow and do all of these fancy things of life. Living systems must reproduce. And as animals, we think of it as in typical animal sex, right? So with the internet, this is going to be very, very difficult. Because conceptually, what you would have is one internet having sex with another internet, and it makes a baby internet. 
and none of that makes any sense if we think about it from the perspective of animals. But instead of thinking about animals, let's think about fungi. So fungi live in these mats of cells. And they're called, uh, the, the individual filaments of the cells are called hyphae. And if the hyphae tunnel through some substrate and meet a hyphae of another fungus, they will kind of exchange genetic information and produce a new fungus that has the genetic characteristics of both of those types of fungi. The internet also lives in, say, a mat, right? But it's a mat of users' information and connectivity. And if a mat of one type of specialized users meets a mat of another group of specialized users, out from that you produce new information. You reproduce new ideas. You reproduce new fields. And these are all different forms of reproduction, not in the way that you may believe in reproduction, but it is reproduction. It's reproducing new ideas, new thoughts, new fields. All living systems adapt. And we mean by this, they adapt over time, they evolve, they change. This one is very simple. The internet absolutely changes over time. Think about the way that the internet started. It was brought to you on phone lines into your computer. And then it came in on special cables. And now it's beamed through space to your cell phone. So the way that we get the internet is changing over time. It's adapting. Even the way that we store information is changing. So when I was born in the 1980s, we used to store information on one of these things. This is called a floppy disk. And those youngsters, if you can't figure out why it's called a floppy disk, because it flops around when you shake it. And that's called a floppy disk. This was in the 1980s. Nowadays, this cutesy little penguin is used to hold data. 4,000 floppy disks can fit inside of one penguin. 100% adaptation. So the internet, to me, is quickly becoming a living creature. We can see it growing. We can see it doing all of these traits of life over time. And if it is a living creature, it's a living creature as a mutualist. It needs us to power the internet. And so how can we really, uh, really participate in this process? And what we need to analyze is, on the other side of it, are we becoming obligated to the internet as well? Are we becoming mutualists that depend on the internet to survive? So what are the characteristics that make us human? And there are a lot of characteristics that make us human. Finance, science, uh, many, many things. And all of these are changing due to the internet. In the floppy era, if you wanted to buy something, finance, if you wanted to buy something, you had to physically go to a store, exchange paper money, and get whatever they had available. But in the Penguin era, if you want something, you simply go to Amazon.com. Money goes from one account to another account. Was there even paper currency? Don't care. It's on the way, right? <laughs> in the floppy era, science. If you had access to our one database that held gene sequences, you, if you had access, you would have access to 2,000 gene sequences. Today, in the Penguin era, that same database holds over 180 billion gene sequences. That's how fast things change. Warfare, in the floppy era, only the most well-fed, the most well-represented, the richest countries had the militaries to coordinate troop movements over long distances. In the Penguin era, we have a situation, especially in the uprising in the Arab countries, where they are coordinating troop movements using Twitter. The Penguin era is changing warfare. In the floppy era, if you wanted to get all of your friends together, you had to find them. You had to give them a little note. You had to tell them <laughs> what, part, what the party was going to be, what time they had to show up, what kind of clothes they were going to wear. In the Penguin era, you post it on Facebook, and all 65,000 of your friends tell you they're going to be there. <laughs> In the floppy era, if you wanted to meet your soulmate, it was hard. You had to meet your soulmate. You had to actually meet them. <laughs> you, 
You had to go to work and find your soulmate. You had to go to a social organization, a bar, whatever you could do. At the worst, you could get your friend Tim, who's got a cousin who's got a great personality. <laughs> In the Penguin era, what are you interested in? What are your hobbies? You will find somebody that has those same hobbies online. The system works beautifully. Some of the happiest people I've ever seen in my life together have met through the internet. So if you're like me, you can really feel this coming. You can really feel it coming. The internet is growing, it's becoming a living creature. And so now we're getting to a point where some of you are ecstatic about this. And some of you, you may start to panic about it because the internet is becoming alive. So I'll address you in two different groups. Those of you that are ecstatic about the internet and all it's going to bring to our world. That is fantastic because that thing is awesome. <laughs> but here's what you need to do. You need to make sure that you have great critical thinking skills because the internet is full of garbage. And you have to figure out what is the truth and what is the garbage. And so you need to be able to think very, very carefully about what you're looking at. Also, learn how to influence the internet. Learn how to computer program so that you can control the internet and the internet does not control you. That is the main goal here. It's very important that you learn how to control the internet. At the very least, learn how to Google correctly. Some of you people are Googling like a paragraph. You can do the same thing in two words, just trust me. All right, those of you that are scared, and I can see why you could be scared, because the internet is growing at an amazing rate. And what I will tell you is you have the power to keep this from controlling you. You are the people that need to hold on to the physical representations of our lives and our culture, right? If there's a physical representation of your culture, hold on to it, because that is what's going to keep the internet from controlling us in the future. If you're sitting at a bus station, take your face out of your cell phone and talk to the person next to you. Maintain those physical bonds that keep us together, because that is what is really important in this world. One thing that I always stress, learn about nature, because nature is a physical thing that is around us, it's not on the internet. Learn about the normal plants and the normal animals that are supposed to be in your area. Conservation, take care of them, because if you don't take care of them, the internet culture will destroy them, I promise you. So it is up to you to take care of the things that are out and around us, because if you don't do it, I promise, they will go away. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out. I want you to meet a new person. I want you to have an adventure away from that thing. I want you to have something new. I want you to write about it. I want you to put it on the internet so that I can read about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>